big thanks to the organizers for having me and hosting this uh, amazing event. It's been a, a great two days so far. Um, I'm going to tell you about a journey that's still in progress on our adventure to drug NAV 1.7 for, for chronic pain. I'm going to first begin at the end and, and thank the hordes of people who helped um, with this project. It takes a, a family to discover drugs, and I'm happy to speak on behalf of that family today um, for Amgen. So first, let me start with the problem statement. Um, chronic pain is defined as pain that lasts for more than three months and doesn't remit as injury is removed or healing occurs. And over 100 million Americans um, suffer from chronic pain, which is collectively more than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined, which actually is quite a striking figure. Latest results indicate that over 130 people die per day from opioid overdose. Um, you can't go one day without reading a news article about the opioid epidemic in the U.S. So this really points to the need for new non-addictive pain therapies and compelling new targets to, to prosecute. So enter what I think is one of the most compelling pain targets to emerge in the field in the past couple decades, and that's the target NAV 1.7, which has really exquisite human genetic validation in terms of bi-directional um, information from loss of function individuals with complete absence of protective nociceptive pain, and then gain of function individuals with various flavors of spontaneous pain, either erythromalalgia, um, small fiber neuropathy, or paroxysmal extreme pain disorder. 1.7 is a, a voltage-gated sodium channel expressed in the peripheral nervous system and responsible for the upstroke of the action potential in, in nociceptor cells, um, taking information back from nerve terminals in the skin back to the dorsal horn uh, in the spinal cord. It's a complex polytopic membrane protein of 24 different membrane domains, which fold into a, a four-leaf clover-type structure uh, shown here, where the sensors of voltage are on the outside and the pore resides on the inside. And as the cell is depolarized, the sensors um, transmit force to the pore that opens and let sodium transmit down its electrochemical gradient into the cell, causing a cell depolarization. As you can imagine, this target is intensely pursued by the industry for um, novel pain therapies, and that is summarized on the next slide, um, looking at really four basic different pharmacological binding pockets that the field has prosecuted and is still prosecuting. I'll tell short vignettes about two of these in my presentation today. Um, starting from the, the left, sulfonamides, first pioneered by Icogen and Pfizer, bind to VSD4 and lock the channel in an inactive conformation. Um, number two are the pore blockers like TTX and saxitoxin. Um, these occlude the conduit for sodium entry coming into the cell. Number three are peptides derived from tarantulas. Um, they bind the other half of the NAV channel in VSD2 and really lock NAV in a closed or deactivated state and decrease activation by depolarizing stimuli. And finally, four, probably the best known, are the local anesthetic binding compounds, lidocaine, tetracaine, carbamazepine, um, that cause non-selective block of NAVs in a use-dependent manner. So enter Amgen. Um, I was like a kid in a candy store when I first came to Amgen. There's 14 different modalities we can pursue for drug discovery. And the ones we leveraged for NAV 1.7 have little green boxes next to them. We looked at small molecules, we looked at antibodies, peptides, peptide antibody conjugates, and also we've dabbled a bit in, in siRNA. So I'll tell you a bit about some of these efforts um, for the rest of my presentation. Before I do, I first want to highlight a couple challenges that we face uh, in drug discovery to find 1.7 
analgesics. And the first is isoform selectivity. Um, we have nine members of the NIAF family in the human genome, 1.1 through 1.9, um, serving key functions in the central and peripheral nervous system. For a compound that can't cross the blood-brain barrier, you want to avoid NAV1.5 in cardiomyocytes, NAV1.4 in skeletal muscle, and, and NAV1.6 in motor neurons primarily. You'd like to get around a thousand-fold selectivity if possible to maximize your, your safety window for a therapeutic. The next challenge is that we're not really trying to block NAV current, we're trying to block an action potential, and that's the currency of pain. Um, in our hands, it takes a lot more compound to block a spike in a C-fiber than to block a 1.7 um, sodium current coming through a cell. And that's shown here in the middle panel, looking at blocking NAV current in uh, the black trace compared to blocking spiking in current clamp mode in that same neuron with the exact same holding potential uh, in the red, spike, the red curve. And you can see if you block half of the NAV current, you have no effect on spiking. You really have to block 80, 90% of current to really block spiking significantly. So there's a receptor reserve, if you will, and you require a high degree of target occupancy to block spiking events in, in nociceptors. And finally, more so for large molecules, you have to um, access uh, fascicles expressing NAV 1.7, the axons behind barriers, including the blood nerve barrier and the perineurium, and that's not a trivial task um, from a large molecule perspective. So the first story I'll tell you are about peptides. Um, we were driven by pre-alt, an approved therapeutic derived from a, a cone snail toxin um, called conotoxin M7A, a poor blocker of CAV 2.2 that Diane um, just spoke of. So given this validation clinically, <clears throat> we comprised and looked at a collection of about 20,000 different venom fractions from the different creepy crawlies you see on this slide and found that for the most part spiders in particular, tarantulas were most enriched in 1.7 blockers using a high-throughput EFIS screening platform. These are oftentimes non-selective, so peptide SAR and rounds of this were used to engineer in potency and selectivity against some of the off-target isoforms. So we changed every non-structural position to a hydrophobic, to an acidic, to a basic, um, to an alanine. Um, and we found there's really two surfaces um, from that result. Really the front face we think is the 1.7 binding face and the back face faces the external milieu. Um, and after a couple years we got to a point where compounds were potent in the single digit nanomolar range and a thousand fold selective over NAV 1.4, 1.5 and maybe a hundred times selective over NAV 1.6. So the first challenge I mentioned kind of check that box in terms of potency and selectivity. We understand how these compounds work mechanistically based on nice crystal, crystal structure work done by the Genentech group. We think there's an electrostatic interaction between basic positions on the peptide and acidic positions on the VSD2 of NAV 1.7, and that really locks that voltage sensor in the down state or the deactive state and decreases activation by depolarizing stimuli. That being said, if you do invoke high-frequency depolarizations, as shown here in the black curve, you can decrease peptide block, pop it off that binding pocket, and recover uh, 1.7 activity. Using chimeras, as shown on the bottom, between 1.5, which is not blocked by the peptide, and 1.7 that is, we localize the binding site to VSD2 as being sufficient to recapitulate um, channel inhibition. So we know how the peptides work mechanistically and where they bind within the 1.7 structure topologically. So the second problem was, can you, this block an action potential? Uh, the answer is yes. These are rat neurons in a dish in an MEA type platform. Um, the top shows an active molecule and the bottom a less active molecule with one point mutation that abrogates block but retains structural integrity of the peptide. And you can see as we increase the dose of capsaicin, sorry, increase the dose of compounds, we block capsaicin-induced spiking of these action potentials in neurons in a dish. 
Um, and the IC50 for that block is right shifted compared to the IC50 for a NAV17 block by tenfold or more. Again, suggesting a high degree of occupancy um, to block the currency of pain within these neurons. Moved on to a more complex preparation, an ex vivo saphenous nerve skin preparation, where we apply mechanical stimuli to free nerve terminals in the skin and record C fiber spiking within the saphenous nerve wrapped around an electrode in a second compartment. And you can see here there's both dose and time dependent inhibition of C fiber spiking in response to mechanical activation, whereas there's no effect with the inactive peptide, which is shown here. Um, at the highest concentration, similar to the, the buffer control. So we can access the channel um, in, in skin nerve endings. We did see weak effects of the compounds in pharmacodynamic assays blocking behavior with 1.7, but for a chronic pain therapy, you really want to increase the half-life and reduce the dose frequency for such a molecule. And so to do that, we conjugated the peptide to an antibody to decrease renal filtration and increase recycling via FCRN pathways. And shown here is the increase in PK we get from a naked peptide, shown in red, which is only hours long, compared to the conjugate in blue, which is a half-life now of, of over three days. And there was no proteolysis between the peptide and the antibody conjugation, so it was intact for the duration of the experiment. And the last question, can this actually access the compartment? Can it extravisate, get across the blood nerve barrier and access 1.7 and axons um, at the target site? Again, the answer here is yes. Comparing expression in wild type mice on the left compared to 1.7 knockout mice on the right, using an antibody against the FC portion of the conjugate, suggesting that would show full length um, molecule being present. You can see a nice signal for the conjugate and olfactory sensory axons, as well as sciatic nerve axons in wild type mice, whereas there's no signal in the knockout mice. So this was a 1.7 dependent distribution to the target site. Now this did give weak effects in blocking 1.7 dependent behavior, but not robust inhibition. So further advances in this space require A, increase in uh, exo, or increased access across the blood nerve barrier, or B, increase potency of the compounds down to the picomolar range, and that's a focus of future endeavors for this modality. Let me switch gears to a second modality, small molecules of sulfonamides, again, first put forward by Pfizer and, and uh, Icogen. You can see here's the example of a compound 8379, which is very potent, again, NAV 1.7. Uh, it's a low nanomolar IC50, and between two and three logs selective against the other human NAVs with this high throughput EFIS based platform. It also blocked mouse NAV 1.7 and that channel in native neurons um, using whole cell patch clamping. So potent and selective. Again, this was the first challenge we had to overcome. Uh, we also know how this works mechanistically, again, by nice work from Genentech using crystallography. Um, we believe the sulfonamide warhead binds to the fourth arginine in the fourth alpha helix of the fourth repeat motif and really locks NAV 1.7 VSD4 in the up state, which now is the inactive confirmation for that voltage sensor and really decreases those compounds from contributing to the upstroke of an action potential. These compounds can also block spiking of human DRG neurons derived from organ donors in a current clamp mode in both a frequency and concentration dependent manner. You can see here, um, as we induce spiking at three or 10 hertz, the frequency we think human C fibers spike in response to pain in vivo, we can see robust inhibition of, of those spiking when the cells are injected with current at 1.5x the rhea base. And again, when you get around the 10 times the NAV 17IC50, you can see robust inhibition of spiking of the currency of pain, again, in the form of action potentials. The last question, can these compounds access the target and, and block 1.7 dependent behavior? The answer again here is yes, using a battery of pain assays, either nociceptive pain, pain protective pain in response to capsaicin injection into the paw, inflammatory pain in response to a, a burn of the paw, 
or neuropathic pain in response to a nerve transection in a spinal nerve ligation model um, in a dose-dependent manner and similar to controls like morphine, naproxen, and, and gabapentin. I should point out all these endpoints are 1.7 dependent because they're absent in knockout mice or functional knockout rats. So this shows target engagement and provides a path of models for translation as compounds move forward into the clinic. So I began with the chart of different modalities. I'm going to end with a new one we've been prosecuting um, using siRNA as another option to drug NAV 1.7. So this is a pilot experiment using a HEC-293 as a model system where we tracked 1.7 RNA by PCR, protein by Western blot, and then current using an automated EFIS platform. Um, a couple points to raise here. First of all, if you knock down transcription by 50%, which is the red point here, there's no effect on function, suggesting maybe the half-life of the protein is longer than the half-life of the RNA in this heterologous expression system. To knock down function 50%, you have to knock down transcription by about 75%. And to get full knockdown of current, it's almost complete knockdown of transcription at the 90 plus percent level. We want to repeat this in native neurons and think about how to best deliver an siRNA in vivo, um, either intrathecally or via systemic uh, dosing routes. So let me conclude by going back to the beginning um, we talked about three major challenges for 1.7 drug discovery. Um, selectivity in trying to get a thousand-fold, if possible, over some of the other peripheral navisoforms. That's been done successfully for two chemotypes, peptides and sulfonamides. We talked about blocking the currency of pain with action potentials. We can do that in either mouse or human DRG neurons. And finally, for large molecules, making sure they can get out of the bloodstream and get across barriers, the blood nerve barrier, and access 1.7 in axons. And that's been shown at least from the peptide antibody modality. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions you have at this time. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. I think we've got time for three or four questions from the audience. Um, Ken first. Ken. You kept on addressing this, but I didn't get the, the final punchline. So you said at the beginning you need to knock down 80% of the current before you eliminate action potentials um, in the DRG neurons. But, but in most cases, what you looked at was a decrease in firing rate. And in central neurons, you can decrease the current by 10, 15%, and the cells adapt. And to, so how much actually do you need to knock down for it to actually have an effect on pain sensation? You don't need to totally abolish action potentials. It's, it's a great question. I think the field's still wrestling with, with that question. Um, I can tell you from our experience using state-dependent blockers, and again, the IC50, that is very contrived based on the protocol that you use. You can make a compound micromolar or a nanomolar by the holding potential and the, the use dependence. But in general, in our hands, if you cover the NAV17 IC50 by around tenfold, you can see robust inhibition of, of pain behavior in rodent model systems which is in line with the block of spiking I showed um, in current clamp mode. So we suggest you really need to totally abolish it, all spikes. We don't want to fully block NAV and get a SIP-like phenotype. But I think if you can dial down the volume, there's a window where you can you know, block pain in humans without um, blocking nociceptive protective pain and causing damage to burns or other injuries. Say again, I didn't quite follow why the nanomolar affinity peptides, why you think you need to get to even lower, uh, higher affinity in picomolar for them to be effective. I mean, they, they apparently get, get to the nerve okay, and you'd think a nanomolar over yeah. hours or three or four hours would be very effective. So we hit that pretty hard. Um, so that comment was referring to the peptide antibody conjugates in, in particular. Um, our best conjugates were probably 510 nanomolar, and we showed biodistribution to the nerve compartment visually, um, but that did not show receptor occupancy. So that could have been 1% target engagement, enough to see a signal, but far south of what you need to block pain behavior. So by analogy, I speculate either you have to get more out of the blood and to the target, 
uh, and or decrease potency so that what gets there is more active and can block more target um, at a similar dose. So any more questions? Uh, very nice work. Uh, I have a question that is mostly a little bit of curiosity, also related to DNA 1.7 inhibition. And the thing is, it has been proposed by John Wood work that in part the, the complete lack of uh, um, pain in the mouse models and even in humans when, when you have a full knockout of the NAV 1.7 is due to uh, an increase in the expression of encephalins uh, and that that is required actually, actually for that, that al al analgesic effects. Uh, do you think that this could, I mean, I'm not sure whether that is only related to full blow, I mean, or disappearance of NAV 1.7 and some development, uh, development compensation during I don't know, um, the embryonic, embryonary states, it, could this um, have, have any effect in the transient block? Because the suggestion is that you need complete full block all the time to recapitulate, the, the, say, the, the analgesic effects that you would see with the knockout. Yeah, let, let me say two things to that. The first is, this is an opinion. Um, I do not believe there has been a rigorous test of the 1.7 hypothesis in the clinic to date. So I think when people talk about failures, that, that term is being used incorrectly. I think there's chemical matter coming through the pipeline, which will be a good test of that hypothesis in the very near future. Um, whether 1.7 block by itself is sufficient for analgesia, we're going to get there. Um, the point is it a, a sufficient by itself without something else, like an opioid um, upregulation of encephalins. Um, I'm a strong believer in that any key piece of data should be reproduced independently in the field. I, I don't think that's been reproduced yet independently by a different laboratory. Other groups have tried to repeat that work, both academia and industry, and have failed to see the same observations. So I think that hypothesis is quite interesting, but still quite contentious. Okay, if there's no more questions, maybe you can thank Brian again for a great talk. Thanks thank again, you. Brian.